Hey, before we get into the podcast, I just want to thank this week's sponsor. This week's sponsor is Sock Panda. They are a monthly sock subscription service, and I have personally bought them for members of my family, specifically my daughter. She absolutely loved them. Once a month, she'd be able to go out to the mailbox and get a new pair of socks, and it was always a surprise on like what they were. Sometimes it was like a surfing squirrel and other times there were aliens it was just pretty much all sorts of socks for everything you could possibly imagine and they have men's socks women's socks tween socks uh kids socks and you can go on and you can purchase just one set or you can get a subscription and it makes for a great gift and this we're heading into the holiday season and supply chains are an issue so this is going to be a great gift that gives for the whole year or six months or however long you want to sign up for the sock subscription And even better than that, the Sock Panda team is is dedicated to using its socks to make the world a better place. The company donates socks to those in need for every purchase. As of today, the company has donated over 141,000 pairs of socks to homeless shelters, low-income senior centers, hospitals, and underprivileged classrooms throughout the country. You can't go wrong with Sock Panda. They make great stuff, and they do great things. And today, they're giving our listeners a 15% discount. So you can go to SockPanda.com slash discounts slash inebriart15 to get 15% off your order. And we just want to say thank you to them for sponsoring the show. And make sure you go there and get some socks for yourself or for your loved ones this holiday season. Welcome back, Inebriates. This is Andy, the Inebriate Podcast. And um, I'd love to say I'm tired of talking because this is like my third episode recording today, but I'm not because I'd love to do what I do. And um, weirdly, I just found out that today's guest is formerly local, but now lives out in Chicago. Uh, Daniel Warren Johnson. Uh, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me. It's nice. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah. So, um, how like i grew up okay so i grew up th- maybe three blocks from my local comic book shop and as a kid i would go to school and not eat lunch mm-hmm. and then take my lunch money and buy comics oh yeah that's how i got into the comic book world that was like my first experience like what what got you interested in it and Oh man, uh, it's it was a number of things. Uh, my public library, the Framingham Public Library, was a big part of it. Uh, just going there, and they didn't have like comic books, but they had collections of like Calvin and Hobbes books, mm-hmm. and uh, they had collections of like Dilbert and Foxtrot. And I was just very much attracted to any sort of drawing things that was narrative in nature. So I started there, and in my um, at my grandparents' house, they had some old batman comics and some old dick tracy strips that i yep. really liked reading and they those are in like the big thick hardback bound volumes yeah yeah uh that were like falling apart you know they're like really big tomes and uh i would just eat those up and i knew that there were like i didn't know there was like comic shops out there um and this is kind of before like comic book stores were like kid friendly i guess for lack of a better term Mm -hmm. it was mostly like an adult thing it was kind of like this dark dingy yes like what do you want get out of here you know get by get out yeah you hit it on the head i've been there one kids hanging (laughs) out there yeah especially kids who were like hey do you have any transformers comics like every single time i went in and like nobody's buying 1980s transformers comics to sell in their comic shop at like the late 90s right right yeah yeah uh which and you know my mom and dad were like very watchful of what i bought too so like i had a very small sliver of things that i could purchase but definitely started with like things at my grandparents house and then uh as i started to get older my local library started getting more and more stuff uh in on the library shelves so that's when like dark knight returns i read um and you know born again uh not born again sorry uh year batman year one Mm -hmm. um bone i read bone at the library. oh sure yeah, yeah. bone was mind-blowing for me that was a huge part of my growing up and comics and 
enjoyment of that. And uh, again, Calvin and Hobbes, like it all started, I think, with Calvin and Hobbes, because that's like the first thing I was reading. It's funny that you mentioned the public library, because I mean, I've thought about this before, but my interest in art and what what really got me into drawing in general was two things. Um, And since you're you know, you grew up in Massachusetts, you might know this. I'm not, you seem like you're a little younger than me, but every Saturday morning, if you got up super early, Captain Bob was on TV and it was like one of those step-by-steps like, you oh, let's draw a whale today, kids, or let's draw a cat and a, you know, whatever a shoe. And, and it was, uh, so there was I Captain Bob. Those. Yeah. And if you go on YouTube, they still have some and they're very grainy and shitty, but they're still there. <laughs> Um, it was that. And at my public library, they had a series of books called how to draw 50. And then every book was something different. So it was like 50 Mm -hmm. comic book characters, 50 buildings, 50 circus things. And I would like every, you know, every time we went to the library, I would check one out and I would just like, weirdly, I wouldn't go through the step by step because I was too impatient. So I would just go to that last picture and try to like copy it as best I could. (laughs) Oh, right on. Yeah, I man, you want to talk about Massachusetts local programming at like four o'clock in the afternoon, Transformers reruns would happen. This is yeah. like back in late nineties. I lived for that stuff. That was, that was oh, yeah. I was uh at that time I was oh late nineties. I was out of high school already, but um, okay. let's see. I was a huge Robotech fan. Yeah. And uh Star Blazers. That was my jam. Right on. Uh, and Massachusetts, so Star Blazers ran three seasons, but the third season only ran in certain markets, and Boston happened to be one of them. Okay. And um, I'm not sure if you're familiar. They, it's Space Battleship Yamato is like the official right. know, Japanese name. But um, the thing that drove me crazy is every day, during that show, there was advertisements for Mr. Big's Toy Land on Moody Street in Waltham. <laughs> and it was all import toys. And at that time, there was no way to get that stuff. Like, I have absolutely no idea how this guy came across this stuff. And I drive my mother crazy being like, can we go? Can we? She's like, I'm not driving you to Waltham. <laughs> Waltham, yeah. You know, and as a kid, I'm like, I don't know how far that is, you know. But yeah, it was uh, Mr. Big, Mr. Big's Toy Land. I always wanted to go. I remember Waltham. There was a comic book store in Waltham that had the last issue of Battle Chasers issue eight. Uh, that like this is back when like you know Joe Mad's Battle Chasers was coming out like every year. Yeah, you know it was like not regular in any way, shape, or form. And uh, like issue nine had come out a few months later. It had come out a few months before I had called. And I was like, hey, I was calling every comic book store in Massachusetts. I was like, do you have Battle Chasers issue eight? Hey, do you have Battle Chasers? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the guy was like, yeah, we have one more copy. I was like, okay, I'm going to try to get my parents to drive me down there. He's like, whatever, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to mark it up right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, what was your local shop, though? That was Bedrock Comics. Bedrock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yep. I've heard of them. Yeah, uh-huh. mine was and, uh, um, R&R Cards and Comics in Whitman. Right on. Yeah, so... They were on Route 9, so they were, like, on the way home from, like, all the shopping. So if you ever needed clothes or whatever, you know, about once a week or some, you needed some sort of thing in, like, Shopper's World on Route 9. We'd drive home on Route 9, and I'd, like, beg my mom to stop. Please, Bob, please. And I would always go in there and bug the heck out of them, you know? Now, what style of shop were they? Were they the kind of predominantly new issues and like lots of swag or were they kind of like that old dark dingy with just long boxes upon long boxes upon long boxes. It was like something right in the middle. Yeah. Cause I remember they had new issues that would come out every week. Um, and then they would have like all, they'd have a lot of long boxes and then they'd do like those collections of runs that they'd have on the oh, shelf. Yeah, sure. Yeah, kind of like before graphic novels were a thing. They yeah. were like collecting all of the single issues into like prepackaged like um, things. Either like mini the- mini series or like this is the whole Civil War run or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. This yeah. is way, I mean way before Civil War, but yes, that's the same vibe. Yeah. Um, and uh, I would go in there and just like my mouth just would hit the floor, and so exciting to be in there. And then I remember they would always like put the um, 
they just did were not they didn't like cater their like shelf to like whether it was like age appropriate for kids you know so it didn't matter <laughs> yeah. if like you know it was like two feet off the ground it's just like a naked lady on a comic book cover <laughs> and my mom is like losing her mind like can't be in here this is completely inappropriate yeah and uh i just ate it up i loved it so much good it's, times so this whole time were you kind of drawing what you saw in the comics and and copying the pages and yeah i mean i was doing that a little bit it was so like i said it was tough for me to get comics because my parents were so protective of like what i got yeah but uh so the first thing i really started drawing was power rangers because i was watching a lot of power rangers reruns when i was growing Mm up sure and just drawing all the power rangers and this was like my main thing for a while and then finally i got my hands on some comics which like then i like actually knew what like optimus prime looked like yeah um so I kind of use that as a visual reference or now you can just Google image everything back then. It was like, you know, you have one comic book, which has a drawing of Optimus prime in it, like a drawing, like one drawing. You're like, yes, this is, ha- this, this is my, my whole library here. You know, yeah. I what does his back look thing. like? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. it wasn't even a transformers comic. It was an ad for the VHS for the transformers movie. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. And it was just like in the back of a comic book. And I treasured it for years because it's the only images that I had. Um, it's and so, funny when I went yeah. to art school, uh, you know, we'd have people come in and talk to us about like, you know, you know, industry professionals and be like, oh, this is what we do and blah, blah. And one of them was like, oh, you need to keep files and books of like reference material and blah, blah. And now you're like, no, no, yeah, no. It's funny that you mentioned that because I used to use like my iPad for a lot of reference and I still do sometimes for quick stuff. But if I have to like draw from reference or like get a bunch of different ideas, I'll like compile it in Photoshop and I'll print it out on a piece of paper because I cannot stand looking at a digital screen and then going back to like the pen and paper or pencil and paper drives me crazy. So I'll like, I have like on my screen right now is a bunch of like cathedrals of stuff that I'm drawing. I just print it out and you know, like on black and white crappy 11, eight and a half by 11. Cause it just feels a little more tactile and real. Yeah. Uh, but it is true. It's so easy to get your hands on imagery now in a way that it wasn't before the same thing happened to me. I was on a panel with, I'm going to name drop here and I don't care. Dave Gibbons, mm-hmm. uh, artist of Watchmen. And, uh, I've heard we of were ta- <laughs> Oh yeah. We were talking about, pro- we were talking about process on this panel and, we were going back and forth, you know, and I was like, then I like look up some stuff and I print it off in Photoshop. And he's like, he was basically like, Oh, these young punks. When I had to draw Scotland yard, I had to write to Scotland yard and have them send me photographs. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny. Cause like every industry has that. Like old school aversion to technology. I was at like an open studios thing. And I was, you know, going from studio to studio. And this one I walked into, it was really interesting. It was these three guys and they made scale models for uh, uh, museums. So it was all like battleships and World War II airplanes. And, and like, you know, I'm kind of looking around and seeing all the stuff that the, is in process or they finished. And I kind of looked at all three and I go, all right, which one of you hates 3D printing? And the one guy's like, fucking 3D printing is blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I knew it. I knew one person was going to hate it. You know, and the other guy's like, I do it all the time. But there was one guy's like, it's cheating. And, you know, there's always that aversion to like anything new that changes the industry. Yeah, I, it's it's hilarious, you know, the different like kind of uh, viewpoints we all have on it. But I think for Dave, it was more like, it was almost like an, uh, like he was in awe. He was like, I just remember what it used to be so hard to get images. And now it's so easy. He's like, his head didn't know what to do with it. You know? Yeah. I mean, now you can get almost too many. I mean, it makes it, I don't know what the, I don't know what the solution is. It doesn't feel as special, you know, to get something like, you know, when you, you you get that image of that thing that you, 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 you're, you have no idea what it is. It's so hard to find. It's like a treasure hunt. Um, yeah. I remember that was with me a lot, you know, like panels, specific panels and comic books that I loved and like going to friends' houses and like, okay, what issue of cable was that where that really cool pose was, you know, and trying to find that in a comic book store. And of course they don't have it. And uh, before the internet and even when the internet did come like Joe 
you know, the, the, the internet screen would load. Like, oh, like bar oh, by bar. Slowly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, bar by bar. And then like it would be blurry and then it would go again. Sometimes it would be <laughs> four times before you get the final image, you know. Um, and then you'd print it off. And then, but it would take forever to print. And then printing, I remember the, the cartridges were so expensive. Mm-hmm. I would have to like start printing right after my mom like went grocery shopping so that it would print off by the time she came, by the time she came back. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I would love for someone to have done a time study to figure like, you know, you say you sent off that email for the image or you, you tracked it down or whatever, and you, you downloaded it and took X amount of time and, then printed it out opposed to someone now being like typing into Google. I want this image and then spending like 20 minutes going, no, not that one. No, that one's not quite right. No, not that one. No, that. Yep. And then getting sidetracked onto something else and be like, Ooh, what is that? And you know, yeah. you, there was no rabbit holes really to fall down Mm-mm. those days. No. And I, uh, I cannot stand those rabbit holes. They are the, the death of creativity for me. So oh, yeah, it's terrible. It's rough. But uh, it is very easy to get imagery now, which is cool in a way. And if anything, it just is a push for me to make new things and try and keep things exciting visually. So, yeah. 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 And you have a really interesting style. It kind of reminds me a little, little Judge Dreddy, a little Andrew McLean headlopper mm-hmm. with some kind of anime thrown in there. Um, how did you kind of develop that? Was this intentional or is that just kind of the the things that really interest you or like how did that come about well i had always loved dynamic uh illustration and stuff that felt like it was moving Mm -hmm. and ever since i was a little kid i never spent a lot of time on any sort of art uh like i would draw all the time but like it's not like i would spend forever drawing the black ranger or whatever or the red ranger i would like bang it out and i'd be done and i'd be moving on to the next thing i wanted to draw that was just the, the, always the way that I approached making my images. And uh, I never really thought that there was a room for a cartoonist to exist in that kind of American field where everything is like, everything kind of has to look very um, uniform and like DC or Marvel house style for like lack of a better term. This yeah. is back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, like late, like early 2010s where you know comics were still kind of recovering from like the 90s fallout and a lot of that like really exciting styles had given way to a more like uniform kind of uh universal approach to line making yeah and you know obviously marvel and dc mostly was where people were getting paid to do this stuff and i couldn't really figure out a way to break in so i just was like I don't even really think this is a possibility and not worth me even trying to shoehorn what I would make into a comic book into this industry. So it wasn't until I started seeing like some of the BPRD stuff with, um, with that. It was like a spinoff from the Hellboy book. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, at dark horse. Um, yeah. Oh my God. Why am I blanking on his name? Was it the same artist as Hellboy? Whose name I should fucking know. Uh, Mike Mignola. Mike Mignola. Yeah. Was he doing the art for that too? Mike Mignola was doing the art for Hellboy, but when they broke off to BPRD, he did some of it, but then it quickly switched over to Guy Guy Davis. Mm -hmm. Uh, Guy Davis now does a bunch of conceptual art. He did a bunch of the designs for like Pacific Rim. um, Works a lot for Guillermo del Toro now. But back then he was, you know, doing a ton of comics and his style was very sketchy, really exciting, very uh, loose. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another artist, uh, James Heron, was coming up at that time through the BPRD world. And when I saw his take, his take was very like anime influenced, uh, not as loose, but like really energy and impact focused in a way that I had never seen done in American comics before. Yeah. To the point where after I saw James's work, I was like, I need to try and do this. I need to try and make it because if, if he's getting paid to make comics, that means I could get paid to make comics (laughs) or at least if someone's going to pay somebody to draw like this, I want to do it. Right. Um, So I got to give, credit to james because he was kind of lit that fire under me to to want to be like that uh to want to draw with that kind of energy and you know looking back on it now there's so many people that have like influenced me and like jack kirby james heron um 
Guy Davis, like uh, Bill Waterston. You know, I don't think I'd be the artist I am without Bill Waterston and his kind of stretching just of like Hobbes and Calvin, like jumping out the door, you know, when Calvin gets home from school. All these um, kinds of images and styles of line making black and white art that have like translated into my kind of aesthetic now. I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and it just feels like my style is just an emulation of everything that I really love and have uh, kind of celebrated over the course of my entire life, honestly. Um, So, and the fact that, you know, I just was like, if I just try and draw the way I want to, uh, which I I basically like was seeing James and guys work being published. I was like, okay, they're obviously drawing the way they want to, I think let me see if I can draw the way I want to and get paid for it. And one thing eventually led to another, it's been a long and winding road, but um, you know, the way that I draw on the page is definitely very me. And I'm very thankful that I get to do that now. When you kind of first went through the process of, you know, submitting your work to, to, you know, the, the big comic houses, was it, you know, did you get that? Hey, come on right in and, you know, start working or was it, you know, how many times did you have to submit? Like, what was that process like? Well, there wasn't really any sort of submitting. Um, you know, I think the submission days of comic books and things like that are more or less done. Uh, you know, it's more about what you've done already. And then mm-hmm. if you're worthy to be invited in, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But um, I started doing my own web comic because I was like, nobody's going to pay me to do this. So I guess I just have to do it myself, prove that I can do it on my own consistently yeah and maybe eventually i'll get work and i was looking at doing i was doing a bunch of different visual stuff at the time to try and get paid um and comics was just one of the many things that i was just dipping my toes into to try and get money (laughs) and uh people started noticing this web comics it was called space mullet uh and then i got a call i I started i made a connection with uh donny cates uh, who at the time was um, just, you know, trying to make it as a comic book writer. He had a book called the ghost fleet that was coming out that his artist had, uh, had uh, decided not to do at the last minute. And he needed an artist because the book had been greenlit at dark horse. So I was like, I'll do it. You know, let's, let's make it happen. And so it was kind of me and Donnie uh, attacking this project together and then with it going through dark horse. And then that book started getting seen by people and you know it's kind of a tumbling snowball you kind of run into some different other projects and work with some other writers and after a little while you know i i really knew that i wanted to write and draw my own stuff Mm -hmm. um because that just gave me the most um power over my own career and what i enjoyed i enjoy i enjoy it way more than uh writing the drawing for a writer So I just started pushing myself in that direction. And I got partnered up with a company called Skybound who uh, published The Walking um, Dead. Yeah, The Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah. This was back in 2015. I I mean, I had a connection with them from a little earlier, but the official connection was made with the team. And that's when uh, Extremity was born, a book that I've been working on. I was looking for a home and, you know, trying to get recognized as a writer artist is very difficult in this industry to, uh, you know, stick out and be like, I'm this is for real. I can write too. You know, as soon as you right. are an artist, it's hard to break out of that box. So um, it just, things just kind of rolled from one, one thing into another. And a big part of it though, was me really wanting to be an, a writer as well as an artist and, and doing these sole, pro- these singular projects that I could just focus all my attention on and deliver the best story and art possible. And it seems like nowadays, there's so many venues for people to put stuff out, you know, with mm. Kickstarters and, you know, small press runs and that you can, or, or even just like you said, a web comic, mm-hmm. you can, if you want to commit the time and, and effort, you can, you know, put your own thing out and get it out in front of people. Is there like a real trick to roping in new fans? Like, did you do the comic con circuit and, you know, you know, chill at tables for like sitting next to people who got invited for free and you paid like 300 bucks to be there to make 20 bucks, that kind of thing. Oh man, try 500 bucks. 500 bucks to have a table at Wizard World Chicago 2012. Oof. Uh, um, we, uh, let's see, 
my first Comic Con was Wizard World 2012, and uh, I was making Space Mullet for a few months at that time, and I wanted to like get my name out there, and I didn't know how to like make connections or get new fans at all. I was just throwing this thing up on the internet, and people were sometimes commenting and seemed to be going okay. And I would like put up banner ads, you know, on other people's web comics and pay for them. Yeah. Uh, just I had no idea what I was doing, but I remember I had like a little email list on the right on a little email list that I would um, have at my table and then to help pay for the table, which was like cost 500 bucks. I do zombie portraits of people. Of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That's what everyone did. You know? Yeah. Uh, 2012 that was when the walking did was like at this height of its popularity. Yeah. And they were like likeness portraits. That's how I would make the money for the table and make some more extra money. And then also get the word out about my web comic. And uh, I met some pretty cool people and I'd bring my originals too. So people would stop by. I'd like try and like bring my originals and open to like the sexiest spread that I had. Yep. And people would stop to look at the originals. Cause like original art is sexy and you know, people like to look at it. And I actually got a few people to like stop by who actually like worked in the industry who were really impressed. And that's how I made that first initial connection with Skybound was when their one of their head of business development guys stopped at uh, Wizard World 2013 to look at my originals. And he was so impressed. He bought a few. Oh, nice. um, and we had kind of stayed in contact ever since. So then in 2015, when I approached him, and I said, hey, I have this story. It's called Extremity, blah, blah, blah. He's like, let me bring let me bring over our editor and we'll see what we can do. And and sure enough, one thing led to another and we got that going. So. You know, I did have fans online that helped the book, the comic grow. Uh, but then after that, you know, I knew I did not necessarily want to be a webcomic artist. I wanted mm-hmm. to be like a comic book artist. And after that, once Extremity started coming out, it's all about, you know, making connections with comic book stores, people who uh, order the books. And then hopefully they like it enough that they might, you know, show it to their uh, people who walk into the stores. Like, hey, there's this new comic calling it out. And uh things just kind of have been bubbled and expanded from there, but uh, it's pretty exciting and it's exciting to see. And, um, but it's been a long road and a lot of different avenues coming to, uh, you know, not no, there's no conclusion or anything. It just keeps going, which is awesome. And I'm excited to see what's next. That, that comic con table is so hard to keep that laser focus. Like, you know, I, I started doing it, um, Jesus Christ, uh, maybe 2009. Mm. And, you know, I had grand plans of like, oh, you know, I have this idea for comic and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I was working with a friend to write it. And and you'd get the table for, you know, three, five hundred bucks, whatever. And you'd be like, all right, well, I need to recoup some of that money. And you did the, you know, I've done the zombie sketches. I you know, did sketches of whoever was appearing and, and run some prints. And, and, and then the next thing you know, you, you, you know, it's like four years later and your table's like nothing but prints of stuff that isn't yours. And you're like, what am I doing? Like, this isn't what I want to do. And sure. um, I remember specifically I did uh, uh, Malcolm McDowell was at a show mm-hmm. and I did a drawing of Charlie Brown as a drogue with like a cup of milk and I'm like, I'll just, you know, throw out a few prints of this and whatever, and I'll, you know, defer some of the cost. And then people are like, oh, can you draw Charlie Brown as this? Can you draw Charlie Brown as that? And then like five years later, I'm like, why? I'm to the point where people would see my actual drawings and be like, this isn't your style at all. Yeah. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? And they'd be like, well, all you draw is Charlie Brown. I'm like, not because I want to. And then I was just, I just kind of lost the the love of it because because of that reason that um i feel that yeah i feel that <laughs> and it, it got I, to the, yeah yeah i respect you for like having that focus of being like all right i gotta do this but i'm here to sell you know my web comic or mailing list or whatever it got to the point where like in 2013 the guy actually who stopped from skybound he like looked over at the at the um at the big poster that i had of you know advertising my zombie portraits he's like who the heck is this guy <laughs> <laughs> he had like he didn't know that it was like at the same table and you're like well i don't know <laughs> exactly i was like i don't know who he is i've, yeah. I've never met him before yeah um and uh yeah but after that you know i started to have to trust i started have, having to trust myself to be able to um 
you know, start going to comic cons and putting up that cost myself and trying to push myself more into the comic book world and not be like a convention goer necessarily, but yeah. a comic book artist that happened to be at a convention and you'd be lucky if you get a sketch from them, you know, like that right, yeah, yeah. itself is that, uh, that took a long time. Um, so, but yeah, I, I feel that pain though. Cause I was there too. That's, yeah. that's real. How, so how is that, um, experience transition for you now? Like now you have a name for yourself before for the big boys and, <laughs> you know, is there, you know, do you have lines? Do you have, you know, it's gotta be weird the first time someone brings in a comic that you have worked on, you know, opposed to something that they bought from your table. Right. No, I, um, I have lines in the beginning of the day because people are trying to get sketches from me. Yeah. Um, and I don't do very many anymore at shows cause I'm too busy. I have people coming up and wanting to talk or chat or, uh, get their books signed. And I am primarily there to meet people now, not necessarily to draw. Mm-hmm. Whereas before, you know, I was like a little bit known and then people would get me to, to draw a, a sketch for them. And I would take a ton because nobody stopped my table ever. Right. <laughs> and now I can't do that. Um, so. And there's a difference between being an invited guest and someone who's just in. Oh yeah. Guy, you know? Oh yeah. hundred um, percent. But I, I don't necessarily get lines, but you know, I, I feel like it's like pretty steady. I also don't do like signing time. So I just go to my table and I hang out. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's kind of nice that way. Cause I can kind of hang out and just chill and draw. And then a lot of times people will come who like want to chat more in depth about the books and kind of like pick my brain. And then I have the time for that. Whereas if there's like a line, it's, it's harder to do. Um, I also have kids that not kids, pe- all people of all ages um, who are like working on their comic book, like portfolios looking for mm-hmm. advice or like critiques. And I'm, I'm always happy to do that. I love doing that. Um, and uh, I've actually had some uh, students and people like bring their portfolio back the next year. And like, I get to see them uh, like bringing up their a game and like, oh, that's come and- cool. Yeah, come like it, and I'm looking at their portfolio. I'm like, oh shoot, we we talked uh, last year, and they're like, yep, we talked or before the pandemic. You know, I met a few people from at New York Comic Con who I had m- met or like gave given them portfolio reviews before the pandemic even, and then to see their work, new work is really encouraging and exciting. They've had like almost two years to like power through and try and get better, and they're getting better. Yeah, so that's it, really it, fun to see. It's very exciting uh, for me myself. Um, I get to watch my daughter who's, you know, excuse me, involved in art and in growing as an artist. And when the pandemic hit, I lost like all my creative momentum. Like mm. I, I just, I didn't want to do anything. And it's weird. Cause like I t- I've spoken to so many people and it seems like it either sapped all your creative interest or people are like, I have so much time now. Um, but during the pandemic, uh, friends of mine purchased a house and in mass, it's illegal to sell a house with a swimming pool. If it's got a diving board Oh, for like insurance reasons, I should okay. it's probably not illegal. It's probably, you know, that's probably overstating it. Sure. But, um, so the previous owners took the diving board off and kind of stuck it behind the pool house. And they're like, will you paint this for like an art piece to hang in our pool area? And I'm like, yeah, only if I can do it with Zoe. So like me and her worked on it together. It was so cool because, you know, obviously I've known her her whole life, but this was like the first experience of working with her as an artist Mm -hmm. and to kind of see how much she's evolved. And, you know, she had her own ideas and was giving me shit being like, well, your lines suck, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) And and I'm like, it's only the first pass. I'm not done. You know, that kind of, you know, because we both work in different facets. You know, it was, it's really, it's really exciting to see, you know, a younger person kind of like improve like that. And, and you know, I, I made friends when I was doing the comic cons that the same way that you get to see them kind of move and improve and, and stick with it and some kind of move on to other things, but it's, it's really fun. Yeah, man. For, yeah, I, I feel that. So what are you working on now? Like, um, it, it, do you have like any particular pet project or obsession that you're like, Oh, this is, you know, my new thing that's maybe not necessarily work work but um let's see the thing that i did recently uh i worked on um this uh 
I worked on my Inktober this year uh, was like a bunch. I would just drew, drew different wrestlers. I'm a big pro wrestling fan. I saw the shirt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would, I, so for October, I drew like a different wrestler every day, every day of October. Mm-hmm. I called it Wrestletober. Wrestletober. Um, I like it. Yep. So that's getting public. I'm, I'm like self publishing that, like printing it up and shipping it out. Um, and so that's really exciting. Uh, and that was like a fun little side hustle that I do. Um, I still draw in my sketchbook or I try to a lot. Um, one thing that I picked up a lot in the pandemic is I started doing a little more painting mm-hmm. like with acrylic gouache. Yeah. Um, I really love that meat, that like medium of paint. And uh, I like how it's kind of watercolory, but it's also, I remember trying to work with just gouache and um, you know, it's really hard to build up layers with gouache because uh it's basically watercolor. So if you get it wet again, it, it all your hard it work moves, will right, disappear. Yeah. 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 It drove me crazy. I like being able to like really go over something and know it's not going to mu- budge. Uh, so acrylic gouache is the perfect medium for that. And uh, so I, I do that sometimes in my sketchbook and um, I really enjoy that. And then that's why I never liked uh, vine charcoal. Cause I feel like someone could just yeah. come out and be like, nice drawing <laughs> and it'd be yeah, gone. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Get that, get that spray fixative out, you know, yeah. right after you're done. Um, same. I feel the same way about vine charcoal. It's fun to draw, but then it sucks to try and hang on to. Yeah. Uh, then, you know, I am working on a pro wrestling book right now for Image Comics uh, with a date unannounced, but that's kind of like my project right now. That's my main thing. Um, and that's taking up, you know, most of my time. That's like a, a, a solid work day for me is like uh, drawing and inking, like penciling and inking a page. And I do that five days a week. So that's kind of my jam right now. Um, and I play a lot of guitar. Um, that's kind of like my art thing that has nothing to do with the rent. Yeah. Which is very refreshing and needed. Um, and just a, an escape. Uh, so that's kind of what's what I'm doing now. It's fun. When you, when you're working, are you someone that listens to like music podcasts need silence? Like what, like what's your like day-to-day working process? Like, is it, I try and listen to music when I start to just get me into the groove. Um, yeah. I was listening to the first Slipknot record today. <laughs> okay. Uh, which as really holds up actually. Uh, and gosh. And then uh, I moved on to uh, just, I, I'll put on old television shows that I've seen a million times. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I, it is hard. Like I, if I put on a podcast that's like pretty involved with a lot of information. I will either listen too much to the podcast and not, focus on my drawing or vice versa where like right. uh i just like, like what are they talking about i don't yeah yeah i just tune it out and it becomes white noise which really makes me frustrated so i'll put on something that's like dumb uh like i'm i'm watch the bachelorette and it's just on in the background and it's like trash noise that yeah. it doesn't matter if i like miss something um I, and then i've I have, always liked uh mystery science theater 3000 that way Yep, because you can zone out, tune in for like one joke, and then just like zone out again. Like the plot doesn't matter, you know. Yep, it's it's just that nice. So you're not sitting in silence. And I feel that way about uh, Deep Space Nine. I love Deep Space Nine, but there are so many episodes of Deep Space Nine where like it's not a huge forwarding of like the big overarching plot, and mm-hmm. just you know, just kind of words being talked and and plot points and. I kind of like that. It's comforting. Um, and gosh, you know, that's mostly, I, I do listen to some wrestling podcasts because uh, that's pretty like, I can like, for whatever reason, it's like sports podcasts I can listen yeah. to. It's not a huge deal. So I listen to some of those too. Um, but yeah. Uh, and sometimes I'll put on like old movies that, you know, I've just seen a million times that are like, not great movies, but they just are there. Yeah. I, I need something on in the background. That's for sure. I don't have to listen to wrestling podcasts. I just ask my son and be like, Oh, how was your week? And then it's just <laughs> wrestling. Right on. Yeah. Um, oh, totally apropos of nothing, but you should definitely check this out. I stumbled across this on Instagram. It's called Jurassic fight night. I think is what it's called. It's based okay. out of Arizona. And it's kind of 
wrestling slash MMA, but all the fighters are wearing like Velociraptor costumes. Jurassic Fight Night. Fight Night, I think is what it's called. And it looks ama- like to the point where I'm like, I have to get to Phoenix to check this out. And it looks so because clearly they can't really see each <laughs> other as they're quote unquote uh, fighting. And there's like Roddy Roddy Raptor or something like that. And it's like a raptor wearing a, a kilt. And I'm like, this just looks, looks awesome. so stupid and fun that yeah, <laughs> I'm like this, this needs to like that. If that was a pay-per-view, I would definitely get it. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but where can our listeners go to check out what you're working on? Uh, website, socials. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, when it, uh, the, the, do you have a release date for this? Um, rest wrestling tober i i am already <laughs> um well you can pre-order wrestle tober 2 at my website which is danielwarrenart.com if you just google my name daniel warren johnson you'll find all my social media all my you know website i have a youtube channel as well that um, i go live every friday it's just like a hangout where i draw and people kind of come in and draw with me um very yeah, chill say you got a nice mic and nice up there i can tell this is not your first time online yeah, no, I, uh, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I, I try and take it as seriously as I can. Um, I also, I use this mic for music too. So it's like a double whammy, but yeah, I have a Sony a 6,400 here with like a Sigma, like wide angle lens. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm digging it. It's I, I like the gear stuff. Um, and like a whole ring light over here anyway. Yeah. Uh, I feel so, so like shitty because i'm just using my regular laptop camera because i didn't set anything up we were re- we were recording it's all good it's i mean it's we recorded it's, two it podcasts earlier today and then we recorded our youtube show like last week and everything so oh yeah so you're car. toast yeah yeah so. yeah dude um and then yeah so you can pre-order my book on um my wrestletober book on my website and then yeah social media is just i uh, just google my name and uh keep an eye out for more announcements about uh, the pro wrestling comic and i also have a bunch of books out on like amazon and like barnes and noble and co- your local comic book store some titles including like beta ray bill uh uh sorry wonder woman dead earth uh murder falcon extremity there's two volumes of extremity these are all one and done books so um yeah the the cover of the beta ray bill had like thing fang foom on it right it did yeah yeah um, i was checking that out earlier today i'm like that's the uh the trade paperback of beta ray bill hold on i'm gonna look this up because i should know this but they, they keep pushing it back beta ray bill tpb december 7th at your local comic book store oh so just a couple uh, weeks from now just a couple weeks with the um the trade paperback will be coming out yeah and that's that'll, that'll have the whole story and you know you, you don't have to know anything about Beta Ray Bill or about it, the Marvel Universe to enjoy it. In my did opinion, you, did you write that one as well? Or I did all those titles that I mentioned. I, I wrote. Why Beta Ray Bill? Oh, because he's my favorite Marvel character. <laughs> well, yeah, but why? Like, uh, mm, he looks the coolest. Okay, he's super metal. Uh, he's I like silver characters, so like second characters that aren't quite as cool as like the number one character, like Thor. Yeah. Uh, or Rufio, uh, or you know, insert character of either choosing in there, you know, um, the goose, you know, second to Maverick. Uh, is, it, is it part of like that everyone likes that guy, so I'm gonna like the other guy because I am 100% that kind of person. Be like, like, I'll like the band, and then once everyone jumps on board, I'll be like, oh, fuck that band, I don't want to see them anymore. <laughs> I think it's more like I, as a narrative. Uh, arc and like as story characters I just find them really interesting um, I just like thinking of new ones like um, Wedge Antilles uh, mm-hmm. he's always like the second pilot to Luke um, gosh Boromir to Aragorn you yeah know? sure yeah you get my vibe yeah yeah I get it yeah uh, Beta Ray Bill is like that to Thor yeah um, and I just I like those characters so this kind of was a story about that nice yeah it's cool well, uh, our listeners should check that out. It'll be out just in time for them to ask Santa Claus to bring it, you know, for them. Perfect mm-hmm. timing. Right. Um, yeah, man. If you ever, I mean, when you come back to Mass, I'm assuming you're there's not like an outstanding warrant or anything. <laughs> um, uh, do you hit up like Boston Comic Con and that stuff? I this do. I, 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 I do. Yeah. Um, and then my local shop where my parents, my parents still live around there. So I come 
uh, pretty often. Uh, I go to um, Hall of Comics, and uh, oh, I uh, right know next... that one. I'm so out of the loop now. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, so I talk with them a lot. I'm there a lot. I'll probably be there for Free Comic Book Day next year. Nice. So. Yeah, most of the comic shops I used to frequent are gone. Yeah. Um, I think there's still. Uh, let's see, Rubber Chicken Comics. And they're close to Rhode Island. I can't remember what the hell town they're in now, but they're good dudes. Uh, friendly neighborhood comics, stuff like that. But I mean, mm-hmm. you know, there's still a few around. It's not like it used to be. But. Yeah. Um, but yeah, right on, man. Yeah. You know, uh, don't be a stranger. Look us up. And um, yeah, we'll show you the good food places around town. Sounds good. Yeah. And uh, thank you for stopping in and, and uh, joining us. And thanks to our listeners. We'll catch you guys again next week when uh, I know we took a couple of weeks off, but we're going to be back with some more guests and uh, we'll talk to you guys then. And thanks for checking out the show today, listeners. Uh, if you enjoyed the content today, you can go over to patreon.com slash inebriart to support the show. You can join over there for just a few dollars a month and help us provide this fun content that you just checked out. You can also email us at inebriart.com with your questions, complaints, and concerns, or you can find us on all social medias at inebriart or at inebriart6 on Instagram. And also don't forget to check out our other shows, Bar Talk Podcast, Old Colony Cast, Inebriart, and all the other shows on the Inebriart Network, which you can find at inebriart.com. Thanks again for listening.